Washington Journal continues. The privacy of email is our topic for our next 45 minutes. Joining us, Julian Sanchez of the Cato Institute. He's their research fellow. Good morning. Morning. What did we learn from the Petraeus story that we've seen over the last few days, specifically about the privacy of email? Well, you know, it's a, it's a reminder of how incredibly easy it is for uh, police and law enforcement, certainly uh, the FBI, to get enormous amounts of fairly sensitive information uh, about our private online activities, a lot of it without any kind of warrant or even court order. It looks like in this case uh, they did probably get a warrant for uh, Paula Broadwell's emails, uh, but it also shows the incredible breadth of that. We're talking about something that started as a cyber harassment investigation that led to the exposure of thousands of emails between Broadwell and Petraeus, who was not involved directly in the harassment investigation, um, over a, a period of years. It reminds us that we now have these multi-year archives of all, all our most uh, intimate communications, which compared even to something like a a wiretap can reveal just vastly more intimate information. What's the least needed from a federal perspective to gain access to these emails? Well, the, yeah, the disturbing thing is that under federal law, um, some courts have Im imposed higher requirements under the Constitution, but federal law says that the contents of emails can be gotten under certain circumstances uh, with just a subpoena uh, or a court order based on relevance, meaning they don't need to show probable cause as they would to search your home or tap your phone, um, but only essentially to certify that uh, materials that they're looking for are relevant to some investigation. It doesn't mean that you're suspected even of wrongdoing. Uh, there's something called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. What is that? That's right. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act is the 1986 federal law that provides the framework for surveillance of electronic communications. And the problem is it builds in a lot of assumptions about the way we used email and electronic services back in 1986 when uh, storage was very expensive, when uh, people used email differently, when, for example, it was assumed that you would connect to your email server, download it to your computer, and read it there, where it would be protected on your home computer by the Fourth Amendment. Um, and so the law creates this structure where once email is opened or once it's sat on the server unopened for six months, it loses the requirement that you get a warrant before federal agents can read it. Um, so, so these very sensitive emails, essentially, once they're read, lose their protection, at least uh, except where courts have said otherwise. Um, and when you think about the way we use services like Gmail, where the assumption is not that you will download everything, but that you'll have years worth of your communication, not just email, but chats and other kinds of, uh, other kinds of data just sitting there for your convenience across multiple devices, that creates an enormous treasure trove for investigators with very little protection. The email, uh, privacy of email and federal investigations are topic for our first segment this morning. If you want to ask our guests questions about it, do so on the lines you can see there on your screen, 202-585-3880 for Democrats, 202-585-3881 for Republicans, 202-585-3882 for Independents. Also feel free to tweet us at CSPANWJ and email us if you want. And if you're okay about privacy, it's journal at uh, cspan.org. Some particulars about the Privacy Act, and you kind of mentioned them, and to boil it down, it protects email and telephone conversations and data stored electronically. Emails of six months or older require a subpoena from a federal prosecutor, and emails of six months or less require a warrant from a judge. Unless so, they've been opened. Unless they've been opened. So that matters whether they've been opened or not. It does, except in, this is the problem, is that the law is, uh, in a sense, so obviously problematic that in some federal, in the Ninth Circuit, for example, they've said, no, 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 okay, even if you've opened it, it's still in what they call electronic storage. Um, but especially as actually we move to more different kinds of data. So it's not just that people are storing emails now, but uh, you have a Google Docs that, that maybe you create at one date and then someone else edits it at another date. Um, it creates these kind of confusing questions about when the 180-day clock starts, what this, is this a communication, or is this in, in, uh, in just some kind of storage, and the standards differ. Um, so you have this weird, crazy quilt where where um, you know, it's, there's one standard if it's on your computer at home. There's actually a very high standard when it's traveling on the wire. If it's you know, actually in the few seconds it's being sent, it's protected in exactly the same way mm -hmm. as a phone call, which is a very high level of protection. They actually have to get a warrant and make additional showings that they can't get the same information in any less intrusive way. But then uh, you know, once it lands, a warrant again, and then once it's opened, some places and not others, uh, you, know, you drop to a subpoena or a, or a court order. Um, and so 
it, it creates this bizarre situation where the same email over the course of you know five minutes or ten minutes can be protected by totally different legal standards. And so in this case, because the Petraeus and Broadwell emails stayed in folders, didn't get transmitted, that changed the standard as far as what federal investigators could do to gain access to those emails. Is it it's not clear. Well, there's a, there's a lot of factors there. One one issue is that Google, in particular, one because it's in uh, their headquarters are in the Ninth Circuit, and two because they have a legal team that I think takes the position that constitutionally a search warrant is required. They um, have, have pushed back and, and often demand that federal investigators come to them with a search warrant, uh, and they have a, a large and expensive legal team, and so um, usually it is. Uh, easier for federal investigators to, to just comply than to fight Google's legal team. On the Cato site, you wrote a piece, an op-ed looking at this, and one of the, you used the word phishing expeditions as far as part of this story is concerned. My question is, how much, once you start diving into emails, when does it stop about the ability of how much email you, emails you can digest? Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's a huge and important question. Um, you know, again, when we, if we compare this to phone wiretaps, um, there is an idea that the Supreme Court has endorsed, and a lot of courts have endorsed, that uh, you know, because a phone wiretap is done secretly and because it lasts for a long period of time, it's in a way more intrusive than even a, a search of your home, and so they need additional protections, uh, what are called minimization procedures, meaning if they're wiretapping your phone, mob boss's phone, let's say, um, they can listen to him talking about criminal conspiracies, but if his wife picks up the phone uh, to call her doctor, they're supposed to stop recording at that point. They're only supposed to record the things that are relevant to their criminal investigation. And uh, what, we, what we would like to see is something similar with email, where even more than with a 30-day you know, or 60-day wiretap, you get potentially, again, access to thousands upon thousands of emails stretching back years. In this case, they don't seem to have done a whole lot to constrain that. You do see in digital investigations sometimes judges imposing requirements, judges saying, here's the window you can get data from, here's the process you have to go through, so you have someone review these emails in this way before the investigation investigators get to look at the things that have been determined to be relevant, but that often depends very much on the judge and how willing they are to try and impose requirements. Our guest, our guest studies the issues of technology, privacy, and civil liberties, and new media, all relevant to our topic today. Uh, from the Cato Institute, Julian Sanchez joins us for a discussion on the e privacy of email. Deborah from Cincinnati, Ohio, thanks for waiting. You're on a Democrat's line for our guests. Go right ahead. Good morning. Um, I guess my question is, how does this affect everyday people like me? Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, I guess I have an expectation that my email should be private, or I would like it to be, and I, I, I guess my overall feeling is that it's not, but why is that? How much, how much can the government, like, construe my email to be something that it's not, or what, what are my rights as far as email? What? I don't know, it's just kind of scary, like, to think, hey, I'm sending an email and anybody and everybody can read it. It's just, I don't like that idea. It should be, do well... We, uh, do we have any rights to privacy as far as our communication, and what does the government actually do to me? Yeah, well, so the, the issue here is there are a series of Supreme Court decisions back in the late 70s um, that developed something called the third-party doctrine. And what the, the idea here is that when you turn records or data over to a third party like your bank, your phone company, uh, you lose your expectation of privacy because these uh, pieces of information about you become part of that company's business records. And so there were cases involving financial records held by a bank, records of the phone numbers that someone had dialed held by a phone company. Uh, and Unfortunately, that was taken to mean essentially in a modern communication system where email uh, and other kinds of digital communications sort of by definition end up sitting on someone else's computer that you have a diminished expectation of privacy and the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. Now you've seen signs recently, uh, there was a case involving GPS where Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor said, you know, maybe it's time in the modern context to rethink that. You know, we do expect in reality that, peop that, that our emails are private, that our chats are private, even though they go through Google's computers or Yahoo's computers. Um, but that would be a huge sea change. It would, be, uh, it, it, would, it would take a lot of doing to figure out then, if that doctrine were thrown away, what changes. Um, yeah, I mean, and the problem is in practice, we have no idea how frequently this is done. Because if they do get a search warrant um, to, to read your emails, and if they do uh, use subpoenas to get other kinds of information about your 
your online activities. Uh, in many cases, the law doesn't require them to ever notify you about it. I mean, the weird thing about this case is that if Paula Broadwell had not been sleeping with the director of central intelligence, it's possible that she just would never have been informed that her emails had been read. Um, so that, that, I think, is pretty troubling. So Jan Ness off of Twitter says, well, if the FBI wants to read my tweets or emails, I hope they're prepared for a nap, which goes to the idea of the first call is saying, you know, if I'm the average person writing the average emails, what do I have to worry about? You know, uh, in a sense, uh, there, there's actually something to that, I think. If you look back at the history of electronic surveillance in this country, um, you know, you find that it's not totally random, ordinary people that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI used to spy on. It was activists, journalists, uh, anti-war activists, uh, members of Congress, members of the Supreme Court, politicians. Um, and that does indirectly affect the ordinary person, though. I mean, if you think, uh, what if the FBI had been successful, as they attempted to do, in uh, driving Martin Luther King to suicide by sending him uh, tapes and threatening letters concerning his extramarital affairs, it drove him into a deep depression. Fortunately, he did not kill himself. Um, but, but certainly, American history would be changed significantly uh, if that had been successful. We know certainly that uh, presidents have used illegally obtained intelligence gathered by the FBI um, to plan political strategy, to gain legislative advantage over enemies, to destroy the careers of, uh, of political adversaries. Um, and so the way it affects you is uh, it's probably true that, that um, you know, the NSA and the FBI are not super interested in your, um, in your pillow talk or who you're sleeping with unless you are one of these people. But if you live in a democracy, the fact that the FBI has the ability to do that, has the ability, as we've seen, to decide whether a prominent uh, political figure's career will be torpedoed, um, that, that is, I think, something that affects all of us. Here's from Mulberry, Florida, on our independent line. This is Marcus. Marcus, you're on. Go ahead. One more time for Marcus before we move on. Hello. You're on. Go ahead. Marcus, you're hearing feedback. Just go ahead and talk on the telephone. Well, let's move on to Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, Democrats line. Dave, go ahead. Listen, thanks for talking, taking my call. I think this is an important issue. Uh, one thing, if we could separate the uh, uh, social networking uh, to businesses in corporate America, uh, I wonder if the guests could talk to um, what used to be done. Uh, obviously, when we used to make phone calls, and develop memos um, back in the old days before emails um, and the difference today with with email and the fact that it's really used in the business world as the way we used to use things in the old days um, and I would bring up the case of the Sandusky case which was uh, the emails that were uncovered through Penn State were very instrumental in bringing that uh, that case to light. So I'll uh, go off the air and listen to your comment. Thank you. Caller, thanks. So there are a couple of things to uh, to mention here. Now, talking about something like the Sandusky case, um, uh, we should we should say, of course, that um, as with searches of the home and uh, wiretaps of phone lines, there of course always are going to need to be situations in which law enforcement or investigators have the power to search your email just as they have the power to tap your phone uh, or, or, or search your home. The question is just whether the legal standards are equivalent. And if you think your email is as private as your phone calls or your home, um, then it would make sense to have a uniform legal standard where they have to go to a judge and make the same showing uh, in order to get access to those things. Talking about the business world, um, it, yeah, it, it's actually important to note that the Electronic Communications Privacy Act uh, is, is not, unfortunately, super protective when it comes to uh, your personal email, but it actually treats very differently uh, providers of electronic communication services to the public and non-public ones, which, which is to say, if you are using a commercial email provider, if you're using Google, if you're using Yahoo, um, there's actually more protection in that case than if you're talking about your corporate 
uh, or even school email, those are cases where, because they're not providing it to the public, um, it, it's seen as a different sort of scenario. And so there, um, yeah, they can actually just get it turned over voluntarily um, or in many cases by, by subpoena because it's not seen as um, a sort of personal record being held by someone else, but more centrally as you know, just another part of their business records. Uh, Dan, Newport Ritchie, Florida, Republican line. You're on with Julian Sanchez of Cato Institute. <coughs> oh, hi. Uh, thanks for your show. Go ahead, sir. Hello. Go yes, ahead. hi. Yeah, Julian? Mm hmm Yeah, the question I have is for the last um, 20 years or so, I've used email, I guess, on and off business and retirement. And what happens to those thousands of emails that I've deleted uh, different computers over the years, are, are they still accessible and how? All right, so there's, um, there's a couple questions there. How are emails still accessible? Um, on the hard drive itself, very often it is possible for a, a, a trained uh, data forensics analyst to recover data that's been lost. It's very hard, actually, to really completely wipe out data. Now, if you're talking about a, you know, a, a, a laptop that you've thrown away in a dumpster or that you've formatted many times over, it's likely that that, uh, that information would be pretty hard to retrieve from that point. Then the question is the, uh, the email records that are kept by the service provider, because very often uh, email providers make backups periodically of everything on their servers just in case there's a crash or some kind of failure in transmission so they can restore your email. However, the backups they make for that purpose um, are uh, protected at the higher level. That is to say, um, those are treated in the same way as the email before it's opened sitting in your inbox. So a warrant would be required uh, for those. But there is actually, I mean, I think a serious question. Um, and and this, these kinds of questions are coming up a little bit more, more frequently now, especially when, when there are investigations of, for example, a big corporation with lots of different employees, which is if you've got a big server uh, with a lot of information backed up in it, um, and the government needs access to it. They maybe image that server, make a copy of it. Um, what are the limits on how much they can do to sift through all the hundreds or thousands of people's of information there? This is a question that's coming up in uh, the prosecution of Mega Upload. This is, Mega Upload is a, was a sort of file locker service um, that is being prosecuted for assisting in copyright infringement. And so, of course, their servers were seized by the government from a, a data storage facility in Virginia. And the question is, look, you've got uh, millions, I think, of users who had some of them who had uh, pirated copyright infringing files that they were storing there, but a lot of people who were just backing up their personal files, including their personal photos, their personal documents. Um, and so there's a question of what can the government do to, to, to look through those? And there was someone who actually even sued the government asking for his files back. He said, look, I wasn't a, a criminal. I just had my files backed up there. My hard drive crashed. I want you to give them back. Uh, and the government seems to have actually done something to look through his files to say, well, you, you seem like maybe you've got some copyrighted songs in here, um, so we don't know whether you deserve your files back. Uh, certainly that would cause anyone else who is thinking about asking for their information to be returned to, to perhaps think twice. 202-585-3880 for uh, Democrats, 202-585-3881 for Republicans, 202-585-3882 for independence. To what you were describing then, how does that square with the Fourth Amendment? Which, you know, it says you can only, as far as how much you can look and how much information you can take in these kind of things. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a serious, uh, a serious problem that I think is only going to become more acute. It's the tension between that third party doctrine that says um, once you give anything to uh, a, a corporation basically to hang on to for you, um, you've lost your privacy interest in it. Um, now, in a lot of ways, that doesn't really make sense. If you think about it, you know, logically, the same thing is true of telephone calls, right? Your, your phone conversations are traveling through, uh, you know, AT&T's or Verizon's network. They could, in, in principle, listen to those conversations if they wanted to technically, except, of course, it's illegal for them to do that. Um, so the third party doctrine here is actually something that's not consistently applied. You know, and the same goes for a lot of situations where, in, in some sense, your private stuff is in someone else's property. If you think about a rented storage lock or even a hotel room or a rented apartment, I mean, the fact that I rent my apartment doesn't mean that uh, the government can just sort of rifle through it or ask my landlord to let them in without a search warrant. Um, 
but that's the way it's been applied to business records. And as, as we recognize how much data about us is stored by third parties, uh, we're really going to have to revisit that. As, as Sonia Sotomayor, I think, uh, has, has been early in recognizing. Uh, to that topic, here's Laura Evans off of Twitter said, would personal text messages fall in the same categories of emails? Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so the, the law actually just refers to electronic communications. Um, and text messages are actually a little bit different because, you know, you send something on, on Gmail, that's stored on their server indefinitely. Most cell phone providers um, don't actually store the text message after you've sent it. So I send a message saying, you know, hi, meet me later. You receive it, and then it's basically gone within a few minutes from their computer system, with a couple of exceptions. I think uh, Verizon, uh, not Verizon, uh, Virgin Mobile actually keeps the content of text messages for, um, I think, something like 60 days. And there's at least one other provider that keeps the content of text messages for three to five days. Um, although now you look at something like, uh, Apple's new iMessenger service that's trying to integrate this. So you've got a, uh, your, your chat and your phone text messages are all sort of stored in the cloud so you can get them from your computer or your phone. Uh, one of the side effects of that is that now your text messages are being stored on someone else's server, uh, again, for potentially an extended period of time, which means they are potentially accessible to someone who comes with legal process to go looking through them. Warden is from Wagoner, Oklahoma. Independent line, go ahead. Yeah, how are y'all doing? Uh, Julian, uh, my cell phone, I've had Verizon for six years, and uh, I don't have a home computer, but I got on to all them government tracking codes that are on cell phones, and all them people out there that do have phones think that what the government do listen to all the time, and I got access to a government satellite, and somehow and my phone's tracked like 2407 I'm trying to find out like why all them government tracking codes are on there okay okay um i don't know anything about government tracking codes but uh, he does bring up the idea of cell phone tracking which is something we've seen absolutely explode recently i mean this is something that again was not really conceived when the electronic privacy laws were written. There was actually a, a change made in the 90s saying, OK, they can't, there was a certain process that they can't use on its own to get uh, someone's location information. But, uh, but that's created actually a lot of confusion. And the courts are still working through what exactly the government needs to do to be able to track someone using their cell phone. And there are questions about different methods. Um, so you know you can use sort of GPS methods to track someone very, very precisely. Or you can use uh, information about which cell phone towers your cell phone is connecting to, which used to be just a very general area that you're in. But especially in cities, and especially as more and more tiny towers are constructed to support the huge and growing data traffic over cell phone networks, um, that means that either in real time or historically, meaning looking back at a sort of virtual map of everywhere you've been over the past few months or years, they can triangulate pretty precisely your location. And again, increasingly, because data storage keeps getting cheaper and cheaper, a lot of providers, AT&T for instance, I think basically just now stores information about their users' location indefinitely. Um, so again, that means there's a, a virtual map effectively of all your movements and travels um, stored somewhere on someone else's computer systems. And, and you know, you're probably not even aware that you're leaving this trail of digital breadcrumbs. Um, and we've seen, again, as law enforcement agencies realize the utility of this uh, you know, very handy little uh, tool that requests to cell phone companies for information have absolutely exploded uh, in response to requests from uh, Senator Ed Markey. Uh, we recently learned that more than 1.3 million uh, requests for user information were sent to uh, major cell carriers by law enforcement agencies just last year. Uh, so to that, this is off of Twitter. A viewer asked, isn't it the solution to use an email server located outside the United States? Well, uh, that creates, well, it, so it depends whether you trust the other country's government more than our own. Um, there are plenty of countries that are uh, certainly less respect, uh, respectful of citizens' privacy uh, than we are, although perhaps in, in, in the EU they're a little bit um, 
more stringent. Um, I, I don't know how good a solution that is. Um, again, you're, you're talking about sending email overseas in a way that, that uh, um, exposes it in, in a way to other threats. Um, if you want to keep your email private, one thing to do, though, is use encryption. Um, you know, as long as you've got the encryption keys on your computer, the fact that someone else might intercept it or access it is, uh, is less troubling if they're not actually able to read it. Is there a consumer version for encryption? There are all sorts of, uh, of sure, consumer uh, encryption programs that can be downloaded and, and are usually pretty easy to use. There's a um, pretty good privacy is, is one of the, um, I guess, more famous ones, but there's a whole suite out there. If you just sort of Google encryption tools or email encryption tools, um, you'll find a whole bunch. A lot of them are free. Our guest, Julian Sanchez from the Cato Institute, talking about email privacy. P buddy from Pensacola, Florida, Republican line. Hello? Hello, you're on. Yeah. Um I know the government pretty much does what it wants to do with our emails. I got a friend of mine, well, a couple of friends of mine that are down in Texas, and that's all they do all day is watch, is read emails. And, uh, and, uh, then they sent out. Did that have anything to do with our election? I mean, uh, you're sitting here reading emails, and I'm sending stuff to Fox News and Romney and whatever else, uh, could the government just say, well, don't send them? Um, I'm not, so I'm not sure I, 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 I exactly understand the question. Um, and you see, would it have to do with the election? I don't, I don't know if it had a, a, a connection there. Um, although, although in the Petraeus case, it's worth noting that it, it does seem as though the timing of the announcement in this case was uh, affected by the fact that we had a, an election forthcoming. So the, um, in this case, maybe at least the exposure of those emails was linked to that. How did this end up at the FBI? As far as the the email connection, right? Do you mean the the in the original investigation that exposed this affair, right? So from what we know, and I, I want to, at the risk of sounding tinfoil hatty, uh, I should note that there is a a proud and long tradition in intelligence of protecting your sources and methods by coming up basically with false stories about how you obtained information. So, you know, you've cracked uh, another country's encryption codes, you've intercepted it off a wire, you don't want to reveal that, and so you kind of cook up a story about how you had a break-in at their embassy and you got the information that way. Um, it would not be totally shocking if in this case there were ways they were surveilling senior intelligence officials that they didn't want to make public. Assuming the story we're getting in the press is basically accurate, um, what happened is that there was a Florida socialite who was friendly with a bunch of generals on uh, a Tampa base, uh, and apparently Broadwell, Paula Broadwell, the biographer of David Petraeus, um, I guess became jealous of what she perceived as uh, her flirtation with uh, her, her boyfriend um, and began sending anonymous emails from an anonymous account um, to to uh, to this woman and apparently to others, and Kelly reported this to her friend with the FBI, an agent named Humphreys, um, who pushed basically their sort of cyber stalking unit to pursue this. This is I have I cannot stress how absolutely bizarre this is. I've been hearing from uh, over Twitter from a lot of women saying you do not know how impossible it is to get police to take it seriously when you have actual threats when people are you know f you know intimidating you physically threatening your life with phone calls with emails and they tell you unless they actually do something there's nothing we can do sorry uh, this is a case where we're talking about half a dozen emails that uh, were not even actually threatening in that way they were uh, been described as basically catfight stuff as you know you think you're hot stuff and you should really um, you know kick it down a notch um, and yet this kicked off an investigation that involved using a fairly sophisticated data mining effort to subpoena uh, her IP logs from uh, from Google, to correlate those with uh, with her hotel records, to, to match up her travel with the access from hotel Wi-Fi networks. Uh, also, incidentally, at least one news agency, Reuters, has reported that uh, administrative subpoenas, meaning not even they, they go to a federal attorney, but just the agency itself subpoenas um, the, the digital records in this case, that's actually pretty puzzling. The FBI has statutory authority to issue these kinds of administrative subpoenas in child abuse cases, uh, health fraud cases, narcotics cases, and a couple of other fairly specific areas. 
I'm not aware of any statutory authority they have to issue administrative subpoenas in cases like this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled by that. I, I would like to know, uh, know a lot more about exactly how they obtained the initial uh, records they used to strip away Broadwell's anonymity. Ruby, Ruby, uh, Ruby, Riverside, California, Democrats line. Yes, good morning. I was wondering, there are several websites that uh, say that there are target words that some of these shadow government organizations are using to uh, make lists to send people to those FEMA camps. And those FEMA camps are real. They're armed and they're ready for something. And I was wondering, is there any way that one could find out if they're on one of these lists and protect themselves from this future attack? Thank you. Okay, so there's, there's a couple issues here. The thing about FEMA camps and, and, and trundling people off to them, I think, is, is a little wacky and probably not true. Um, but there is the element of this that is not necessarily wrong, um, is that it has been actually widely reported that the national, not the FBI, but the National Security Agency uses uh, keyword, an among other tools, may use keyword analysis to sift through electronic communications to pick up. Uh, emails, you know, I, you know, one emails from particular addresses, but also potentially uh, electronic communications that use key phrases that might be suggest. I'm not talking here about bomb, but you know, perhaps phrases that indicate membership mm -hmm. in some kind of terror group. So that element of it is not necessarily crazy, but that's mostly for foreign intelligence purposes. This is filters they would be they would be applying to uh, international communications. Um, we obviously don't know anything very specific about exactly how that works because of course it's all extremely classified. You don't represent these entities but uh, the viewer asks, ask your guess why Google, Yahoo, Microsoft email services don't provide an encryption option for email users? Uh, well, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, speak for Google so I can't, I can't say exactly. My guess would be they have a business model based on data analytics. They show you uh, advertising based on, among other things, keywords in your email when you log into Gmail. Um, if they make it easy for everyone to uh, encrypt all their email, um, then if it's, it's real encrypt, I mean, so obviously, if it's encryption that Google does on their side, um, then they can read the keywords, but it's also useless because they have the encryption keys so they can unlock it as easily as they locked it. Um, if it's what's called end-to-end -end encryption, meaning only the user actually has the keys to lock and unlock those messages, then Google can't read it, can't do their keyword analytics, can't derive the data. And you know, you, you have to, in some sense, understand that um, they're offering this massive sort of free service to millions of people. Um, they're not doing it as charity. And so if they can't make revenue off offering this service, um, there isn't really much reason for them to do it. That said, I, I, I should say, I actually cannot think of anything that could be done that would so drastically improve Americans' email privacy, and I'm not just talking even here about the government, but against all sorts of other uh, methods that can be used to intrude on people's privacy by private parties. Um, I can't think of anything that would do more to improve user privacy than for Google, certainly, and, and these other companies to decide that Despite that, the, the, you know, the revenue model issues, um, they're going to roll out easy to use sort of one click encryption, especially you know, because Google has this big identity infrastructure. You have an identity, you know, in a sense, in Google, your Google account, as, as almost like a you know, default identity that people use to log into a lot of other services. One of the big problems with encryption is distributing public keys. That is, if you want to send someone an encrypted message, you need a way to lock it so that only they can open it. And so you need a, a way to use a public key that can lock it, um, that can only be opened by that intended recipient. And then, of course, the question is, well, how do you get that key? How do you associate each known real individual with a, uh, with a public key people can use to send them secret messages? And Google already actually has that built in. So they have this amazing ability to, to, to in a way, revolutionize email privacy overnight. Uh, and if they could find a way to do that, that would still be profitable for them. It would be, I think, an incredible boon to, to Americans. If the last time this type of law, the law for this type of email exchange was done in 1986, what would have to change, or at least in your opinion, what should change here in 2012, especially about the way we use email today? 
So, there's a bunch of, so uh, actually, Senator Patrick Leahy has introduced a bill that would update ECPA. It, it was actually tweaked slightly in the, in the early 90s, but the basic structure does go back to 1986. Uh, and the main changes that Leahy has proposed are to require a search warrant, a uniform search warrant, um, for content. So instead of this weird structure where you have different levels of protection, uh, depending on how long it's been on a server or whether it's downloaded or not, and different rules in different circuits all over the country, um, you would have a blanket rule saying when they want access to content, the standard is a search warrant. Um, I would actually say that maybe a higher standard even, the standard they use for phone conversations would be more appropriate. All the reasons we have additional protections for phone conversations, it's secret. The person doesn't know about it when, they're, uh, when, when it happens. Uh, it's done in a way that affects an extended period of time, um, as opposed to a, you know, a, a brief uh, incursion that can be monitored by a homeowner. Um, all those reasons apply to email, probably even more so. So the additional, I think, requirements of having to show a judge there's not a less intrusive way to get the data, uh, having to undergo minimization, so you're trying your best to not have anyone looking at information that isn't directly relevant to the, the crime that's in the scope of the warrant, that would be an appropriate measure to take. Um, and no one is really proposing this yet, but I think it would actually also be appropriate to look at some of that transactional information. Um, there, there are actually, Ron Wyden and others have, have proposed legislation that would also require a warrant for precise location information, even though that's not the content of a communication that would make them get a warrant if they're going to track your physical location using your cell phone. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would even say that other kinds of transactional data under certain circumstances may be protected. And you, the problem here is drawing the lines. I think it would probably be too much to say, you know, any time law enforcement wants any information about anyone that's in a corporate business record, um, they need a, a full-blown search warrant. That would probably be too high a, a burden. You need to give them some ability to get the investigation started so they can build probable cause. But um, when you think about things like in the Broadwell case, stripping away someone's anonymity. This was an anonymous email account, but then they were able to link it to her, both her, her physical travels and her other email accounts using these IP logs. Um, and that's a case that involves, uh, you know, if you think about it, stripping away an anonymous speaker's privacy shield, uh, stripping away anonymity. And the, court, the Supreme Court has said for a long time that part of the right to free speech is a right to anonymous speech. You can't, um, you can't force people, for example, to sign their name to a, uh, a political pamphlet. You can't make a political blogger you know, sort of identify themselves on the blog, because we were a country that's sort of founded by anonymous pamphleteers. Um, and so I think it might also be appropriate to say that when you're seizing records for the purpose of identifying an anonymous speaker, um, that there should be some additional showing required there. You shouldn't just be able to get it by asking, but you should need some kind of judicial approval for that, too. Darcel is from Leland, North Carolina, Independent Line. Yes. Um, thank you for taking my call, and Ms. Julia, this is very interesting. This past summer, um, I had some issues with just a landline and a cell phone. Ironically, both of them was out of service, and because of that, I was I had a, a local utility bill that I didn't pay because I never received something even in the snail mail. Mm -hmm. When I w went to um, a council meeting to see if they would take off some of the charges because I've never been late before, they said get um, some backing from AT&T in my case. And when I attempted to do, do that, I found out I had to um, have subpoenaed AT&T for just records to say, yes, she did have some issues. So. Um, I was very surprised that I had to go through that just to do a simple search that, yes, she had problems, and here's the proof. Here, this is what you can give to your local utility. Second question is when a person has their computer infected, if they have the ability to do all these other random searches, can they give us the source of um, where uh, worms come on people's um, computers. And I'll take my response offline. Thank, oh, you, thank you so you. much. Sure. Um, so I don't know the specific exact case. That's a little bit odd. I mean, usually, if it's your own records, um, the phone company should be able to give you those without a subpoena, because 
I mean, there's sort of in all these laws a, a, a consent exception. If you're, uh, if you have the consent of the of the person, they can of course cough up whatever records um, they're they're willing to give up. Um, so I'm not sure why that would have been the case. Um, in terms of, of inspecting physical computers, uh, you, often you can uh, trace uh, thing, you know, the, the origin of things by looking at uh, logs on the computer itself, unless it has been very uh, thoroughly wiped. There's, you know, a lot of ways in which we don't recognize that uh, that our computers leave fingerprints um, sort of everywhere they go, and often in, in, in fairly surprising ways. I mean, every uh, basically every Wi-Fi or uh, device or, or network device has a unique MAC address, as it's called, that that, um, that essentially uniquely identifies that machine. So very often you can, um, even as someone's moving around, if, if you have a way of transmitting that or reading that over the network, um, kind of uniquely identify a machine. Um, although, of course, good, well-designed programs don't transmit that information uh, as a matter of course. Um, but in a lot of other ways, um, you can often fingerprint uh, someone's uh, someone's machine to, to detect it even even over the network. Um, the Civil Liberties Group, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, found that uh, very often just by looking at the specific settings of browsers and computers as someone connects to a website, even if you've got uh, cookies blocked and all the other ways that companies usually track you blocked, it's uh, in a huge percentage of cases possible to uniquely identify uh, the computer as it reconnects just because the configuration of the machine is the same and there's always these tiny little differences that let you um, that let you narrow it down to one or a few devices. So Jody says off of Twitter, guarantee privacy only exists with the U.S. postal system. Put a stamp on it and it's a federal crime to open and read. Well, um, but, you know, it, it, ironically that, that may almost be true. There's, there is a tradition of, uh, of protecting postal privacy that, that um, that in, in theory does require a search warrant to read mail, although I should note again that uh, if you look at the history of our intelligence agencies, there have been many periods in history when uh, the CIA or other agencies did illegal mail covers, basically opening um, thousands upon thousands of, of letters without any kind of warrant or other probable cause. So um, that, that's certainly the theory. Um, I, I, I don't know if I would always trust it to be the practice. Here's Columbus, Ohio, Daniel, Republican line. Hello. Yeah. Um, my question, well, it's it kind of, I kind of have a statement and then I have a question. Um, for one, I've been using Hushmail for years and I got put on the Hushmail through a friend of mine who used to work for a company called NetSec, who did some private signal intelligence work for the government. I mean, he knew about the emails being uh, monitored, you know, a long time ago, before it was legal for them to do it. And Hushmail um, is based in Canada, and they offer a very easy to use encryption and end encryption. That's uh, it's pretty cool. Um, also, they don't have to obey a lot of the investigative subpoenas that an American company would have to obey. So, Carl, uh, we're running close on time. What's your question? Okay, my question is, uh, what kind of protection do you think that affords you to have a, you know, an email that's based out of the country? Um, and are there any countries that have international treaties to obey investigative subpoenas? Yeah, I mean, we have, we have, so yeah, we, one is we do have arrangements with a lot of other countries essentially to respect each other's uh, uh, judicial orders for information like this. Uh, in particular, Anglophone countries, the, the um, you know, U.S., U.K., Canada, New Zealand, Australia are part of a consortium called the Five Eyes that, that are involved in a, a great deal of intelligence information sharing. I would not, by the way, be, um, rely too much on Hushmail. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was Hushmail that uh, Thomas Drake, a former NSA analyst, used when communicating with uh, Siobhan Gorman, which is a Wall Street, uh, sorry, Siobhan, Siobhan Gorman, um, who uh, was then a Baltimore Sun reporter, is now a, uh, um, a Wall Street Journal reporter. Uh, he wasn't sharing, of course, national security classified, um, you know, sensitive information. He was trying to blow the whistle on uh, essentially massive waste in contracts given out by the NSA. Um, to you know, large and well-connected corporations, um, but I believe they tried to use Hushmail to keep their communications private, uh, and that did not work. Drake ended up being prosecuted. Ultimately, uh, the government's case collapsed, and they had to, to get him to plead to a kind of minor offense of uh, misusing a government computer. Uh, but I, and I don't know that much about how Hushmail works, but I think they 
operate in a way that keeps the keys on their side, uh, which means that they can then unlock what they have locked. Um, with the proper process. So I don't know how much I'd rely on Hushmail. I think uh, if you want to encrypt something so it's private, use end-to-end -end encryption where only you and the person you're communicating with have the keys. Oh, we have time for one more quick call. Elsie is from Washington, D.C., Democrats line. Um, hi, my question is, um, I, I'm one of the few people that believes Paula Broadwell is a fall guy and that um, there's more to the Kelly story. And I have a question, if um, Mrs. Kelly was able to, as Mrs. Quam Kelly was able to track the general through the emails and why there were 30,000 emails right, no, through uh, the IP addresses. So this is a, a, um, there's a couple things going on here. So Jill Kelly, uh, who was the one who initially reported, the, reported these uh, harassing emails from Paula Broadwell, also now appears to have had a, a sort of long-running uh, email exchange or relationship with, not, not relationship in the sexual sense, but have exchanged a lot of emails with another general, uh, John Allen, who's now under investigation. It's not clear why the supposed victim's correspondence was being looked into by the FBI with another party not involved in this case. It's not clear why, if those emails were not evidence of a crime, they were then turned over uh, to the military, which is now conducting an investigation to see if these supposedly flirtatious emails were in some way inappropriate. Um, but it's not, uh, we should note, like 30,000 emails. They said something like 10 to 30,000 pages of documents. And so what you have to understand is that if you're talking about a group email exchange, so people are being carbon copied and, and uh, emailing back and forth to each other, and you have people quoting the entire previous exchange, so people are going back and forth, and then every previous email in the chain is sort of included in every subsequent email, you can get to 10,000 pages actually pretty quickly over a few years of exchanges. Um, so it's, it's not really clear what what that is about. Um, that will be interesting to follow. Um, in, in a way, that is the even stranger part, because it's truly mystifying what those emails have to do with any of this or why they were being looked at. Our guest writes on a whole host of issues related to technology, privacy, civil liberties, and new media. He's from the Cato Institute, Cato.org, the website if you want to check out the work there. It's Julian Sanchez of the Cato Institute, and he serves as their research fellow. Mr. Sanchez, thank you.